My book, Representation and Reality in Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's Tractatus, is about this little book, uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which is regarded by many as one of the most important works of philosophy of the 20th century. It's a very small book, you can read it in an afternoon, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful book, very poetic, evocative. Many people enjoy it and appreciate it, even if they know nothing about philosophy. But as philosophy, as a piece of philosophy, is, it's slightly disappointing because it's not clear. He says things that uh, seem a bit random uh, and baffling, and it's hard to know what he's really trying to convince us of, and it's hard to know what reasons he has for thinking that, this, that these things are true. Most of the book seems devoted to giving an account of the structure of reality and of our ability to represent reality. Um, and the goal of my research was to try to understand that, try to understand what his account was and why he thought that this was the right way of explaining this, this, this issue. But his account of representation and reality is mainly the result of the strategies that he develops for dealing with three separate problems. The first is uh, difficulties that he encountered when he was trying to understand the work of his teacher, Bertrand Russell, on the theory of judgment. Okay. Russell Wittgenstein came to uh, Cambridge in 1911, in his early 20s, having had no philosophical training whatsoever, with the intention of working with Russell. He spent two years there, and uh, in those two years, many of the ideas of the Tractatus were already developed. Um, one of the things that Russell was working on at the time was what he called the theory of judgment, which was the attempt to explain our ability to represent the world in consciousness, to have conscious episodes that represent things as being a certain way. Now, Wittgenstein thought hard about Russell's position and Russell's proposals, uh, but he came to the view that they just weren't going to work. Um, and uh, what many see as one of the central aspects of Wittgenstein's tractatus, the so-called picture theory of representation, I present as Wittgenstein's alternative to uh, the positions that Russell had adopted with respect to judgment. Uh, it's his way of overcoming the difficulties that he saw in Russell's proposals. The second problem is what's known as the problem of the unity of facts. Um, facts uh, traditionally in philosophy have been uh, construed as composites. Right? Take, take the fact that the pen is pink. Uh, people tend to think of that as a, the result of composing, combining two things, the particular, the pen, and the universal property of pinkness. When those two things get combined, uh, the fact is produced of a pen being pink. Now, there are lots of difficulties with this proposal, difficulties that philosophers have been aware of since the time of Plato. Um, and the second uh, problem that Wittgenstein is trying to deal with is, is this problem, how we get, how we explain the unity of a fact as the result of the multiplicity of its components. How do we explain this process of composition that produces facts? His view on this was that there's no such thing as composition. Facts are not composite. Facts are the ultimate ingredients of reality. If you look at you know, what reality is made of, uh, when you reach facts, you've reached the bottom. It doesn't go any farther. That's the point that he's making in the very first statements of the book, very famous statements, when he says the world is all that is the case, the world is a totality of facts, not of things. The point that he's making is that facts are not composite. And finally, the third problem that he's trying to deal with is the problem of explaining the epistemology of logic. How do we know that facts are stand in logical relations to one another? How do we know that if 
all men are mortal and Socrates, Socrates is a man, then it must also be the case that Socrates is mortal. He developed this idea that the way we get to know those things is by a sort of pseudo-perceptual uh, grasp of the symbols with which we represent these facts. So the structure of the symbols must have encoded in it uh, these relationships. Uh, and I argue that many of the striking and shocking metaphysical claims of the book are demands imposed by this account of the epistemology of logic.